Welcome to the chaos. Oh, oh go. <laughs> Yay! You gotta get better at that. We won't get it. It's only the second time we've done it. Third. I, know. I mean, we, we needed like a handshake, but I kind of like that better. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the chaos. My name is Mikey Tableman. I'm your host, alongside my co-host, Danny J. Goldman. <laughs> Hello, and welcome back. <laughs> Today on the chaos, we have the lovely Sophia Gamina, former bottle server, <laughs> hospitality for years, but is now really focusing on making a difference in the mental health community. Uh, in school, finishing up her master's for psychology in children and family. Sophia's got a lot she's working on to try to help change this world and make it a better place. Cause so if we talked about this a lot, it's f***ed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I begin? Um, yeah, I have a lot. I, I get really passionate about this issue. So, so, Sorry if I get a little loud eventually. No, it's right. But <laughs> we're here to show emotion because you're yeah, like, we've talked yeah. about this a lot. Like the concept of the show is to bring more, um, more to the forefront when it comes to mental health. Mm -hmm. And like, yo, there's so many people that are suffering. So it's like, yeah, get passionate about it. Be honest because that's what the world needs more of. We need more people to speak on it and their experiences and why it was so traumatic and how this shouldn't happen to other people. Exactly. And I mean, it's really what it comes down to for me from what I've lived through and experienced and seen and also studied. Like if we if we change our perspective on what we think crazy is or mental is or, you know, whatever you want to call it, I think that, you know, the perspective is the thing we need to focus on the most. So like, you know, the stigma. So yeah, exactly. And well, I mean, even other pe Yeah, the stigma, of course. But like, you know, perspective. I heard something that today or the other day that was like perspective. Um, perspective creates belief, which creates reality, which creates trauma. And and that's the thing. It's like people think, you know, like you're in a traumatic situation. Not all traumatic situations are going to give you trauma. But I think that the conversation and the, you know, of mental health and of trauma needs to be on the forefront in our schools in our, you know, with our children. I mean, even if it's not in our schools, have that, have those conversations with your five-year-old, you know, figure out why they feel the way they feel or why, you know, talk to them about their emotions yeah. and everything. The, there were several, I remember there was a report, there were several schools across the US that decided for a few months, instead of giving detention, let's give them a meditation uh, session. Oh. So you, you would sit in detention for an hour or they would do a full blown meditation for an hour. And the numbers were crazy about how many of them did not return to detention because they were sat and meditating, were able to kind of look within themselves and help out. It's like, I remember going to school, nobody taught me how to handle the that was going on in my head. Nobody taught me how to handle the bullying, the breakdowns, the crying fits behind the fucking scenes. Like, like, cause this has a lot to do with children because you know, children are our future. Children are, you know, us, you know, at, everyone's a child in a sense. And I think that, I think that if we start with our children and, and educate them and pay attention to the fact that they're going through the same things that we went through when we were kids or similar, whatever, you know, just because you're providing a good foundation and you you think your kid's happy, those conversations still need to happen. So I think that's what's going to create a lot of change, um, just the discussion of it, you know, and that's why I want to start my own, you know, podcast, um, put some stuff on my Instagram social and stuff like that, but essentially just to have that conversation. It's definitely talked about, but it's not talked about enough. And I feel like when it's talked about, it's more for like, it's sad to say, but speaking on mental health is now become good PR. Exactly. And it's fucking disgusting exactly. that a lot of these corporations, like you don't actually give a shit because even though you're promoting it, your products, what you stand for really go against the message that you're trying to portray, which we all see is Exactly. And, and that's why for me too, like, it's something that I've been so passionate about because I've lived through a lot of really f***ed up things and seen a lot of my family members and people that I love go through those f***ed up things. And I think that because I am so particular and I know how, how do, how do you say it? Like, I know how delicate people are that I don't want to just you know, I don't want to start and not have it be like my 
pure vision. You know what I mean? I want to have like a plan so that, so that I keep myself accountable. But at the same time, like it's such a delicate conversation. Well, let's backtrack a little bit. Like where, where, where where are you from originally? And um, let's take it back to how you work your way up to want to be a champion for mental health, like coming back to, you know, service industry and where did you guys work together? We, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've worked together. We work for the same companies. Um, we've worked with the same people. Um, as far as nightlife is concerned, I think, you know, nightlife actually really, really helped me in a very different way. I used to be a very, very anxious person. I still am, actually. Um, Welcome to the club, baby. Let's go. Yeah, but, We're all here. but it's like, you know, once you're at work, you're at work. Like, you don't have a choice. You just got to go. So um, in a sense, I think I think the nightlife industry distracted me a little. It was a little, you know, disassociative. But at the same time, you know, I'm very I've, – I've done a lot of work on myself, too, and I'm very aware of – who I am and how I portray myself and how I speak to people and how I treat others. So I think that, um, I think that like being aware and not falling into that hole that you know how the industry is. It's like, it's a slippery, slippery slope. Um, and I'm grateful enough to, you know, not have had it destroy me or put me into any bad type of environments really. Um, I think it's really, really done a lot for my life. That's an interesting per- perspective. <laughs> yeah, because that, uh, I'm like, <laughs> in, in the way I, I'm trying to think of the ways that it did help me and it did tre- like teach me how to treat people. I, I've always had like Southern hospitality. I'm from New Orleans. So mm-hmm. treating people kindly and, you know, like they're coming over to dinner at my house is always ingrained always in me. Ingrained. You know what I mean? Same, same with me. So yeah. that that goes to that too. It's like, I kind of, you kind of have that or you don't, I feel like, (laughs) especially when you're serving other people. Yeah. The positives though, like coming from nightlife, especially. Yeah. I mean, I think it taught me what not to do. Definitely. The things to stay away from. Yeah. You know what I mean? The the vices and and the, the, literally the black holes, like, you know. You could tell when someone was like fresh off the bus Mm -hmm. and then you would see their like, (laughs) gradual decline oh yeah as they you know they show up like a year later and you're like who is that is that the same person i've seen that uh, sadly you know a few times and it's it sucks because it's it is a slippery slope and it's not meant for everyone right i mean it's it you know i it was a slippery slope for me Mm -hmm. like i think like four or five years ago i'm sure what was some of the slippery slopes in nightlife that then translated to you like all right i need to and work on this for my mental health because this is just not good for me. I mean, you you just left nightlife. Yeah, yeah. So I pretty much I had a, a pretty hard like I I quit what like a couple months ago, and I've been doing it for like ten and a half years. So I, for me, like yeah, the money's always great. Um, at a point, nightlife became a little bit more than the money for me in a weird way because I just it was just a rhythm. Like it was all I knew. And that's also why I want to go back into mental health because I don't want to be defined by nightlife. Um, and and that's the slippery slope part of it. It's also like, yeah, if you survive through it, when are you going to get out? You know what I mean? And I think that's the hardest transition for a lot of people. Um, a lot of, you know, I have a lot of girlfriends that are older. You know, I'm, I'm 31 and I'm still in nightlife. So um, we know people in their 40s still in nightlife yep, bottle serving. 40s. So. I've, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but I mean, I mean, with respect to the girls that I do know in their 40s that are still doing it, they're fucking hustlers. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's so many people that have that slippery slope in, in nightlife. And like, you know, I've had my own, Danny's had his own. And I don't think we really realize how many people go through it. Like, when we did the first season of the show, we had 40 guests. I had no idea half these people were suffering. That's people we've known for years. Oh, wow. And like, I would think, oh, you, you got it like life's easy. you got your head on your shoulders. And then like, no, I dealt with body dysmorphia. I dealt with suicidal thoughts. I dealt with uh, zero confidence. Like, like you never realize. And I feel like nightlife, especially nightlife and entertainment, your world is so based on your image. Oh, but like, yeah. you're not going to be honest about the shit that you're fucking dealing with. No, no. And so, so I'll speak to that. So the one thing that nightlife really, really, did to me, I think. And and it's something that, you know, 
could also have stemmed from childhood too, but is the feeling of like, I was never good enough. Like no matter if I sold $50,000 to a client, you know, one night, it still would not feel good enough for me because I wouldn't, you know, I didn't do the service that I provided well enough or whatever. And I've always had that kind of feeling. But was that but how then, you felt or was that how the people no, you were- No, that's how I felt. Because I feel like a lot of the, a lot of, in, back in the day, the nightlife culture, a lot of the companies we work for made us feel that way. I've had companies made me feel that way before, um, which sucked. I wouldn't say companies. I would say managers, <laughs> you know, <Right. laughs> like, like, let's be real. Um, but uh, I mean, co yeah, companies, too, because they can ins instill, instill some it. things, you know, like in San Diego, you, you know, in order to pretty much work anywhere, you got to book tables. And so that, you know, it's you're working, you know, you're already working for a company, then you're working more for a company. And so it's like. It it dep it really depends. I've worked for a lot of great companies. I've worked for a couple that I didn't love, but probably didn't give them enough time either. So I can't really say anything about that. But um, but as far as my struggles, um, so let's see. When I was younger, um, I was the shyest person you'd ever meet in your life. Like you would not know who I was in middle school like ever <laughs> like I you could not make me talk um I was bullied a lot a lot um to the point like oh, I remember there was like this one girl like it's sixth grade we were in the I was always picked on by these three three girls and this one girl um we were in the locker room and she like whipped me with a belt and shit or something yeah. it was so up Where'd you but grow up? so and i was huh where'd you grow up i went to i grew up in la jolla which was actually very interesting that i dealt with that kind of stuff there because you know i was from a good family you know we had a good i had a good upbringing i wasn't as rich as the other kids but you know everything was fairly good up until you know probably around fifth sixth grade like yeah. around that time um and please know how to like zero in on people who are shy and mm -hmm. look vulnerable Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so that turned into like, you know, I'd go to school and everybody would be ignoring me, you know, all my friends for no reason. You know, like I just show up it's and be like, cool. hey, guys, and like no response, you know, for like weeks and um, and go to girls houses. No, you know, like just shit like that. So internally, I think from a young age, I was. I was felt like I was different and like not belonged to fit in or whatever. And then also, um, you know, that came along with like eating disorders and stuff like that um, for a short time. Um, and then I dealt with that. And then I got past all that stuff, was an athlete in high school, got my confidence back from being an athlete. I played water polo. And um, that's an interesting sport. I've never knew anybody who played water polo. No way. It's gnarly. It's if if they think Hell Week and football is gnarly, water polo is way worse. Like I promise you, I brought because water polo is like Hell Week all year. <laughs> I you know we I grew up in a very nice home. Like I lived with my dad. I didn't have the best relationship with my mom at the time. Um, so I moved out. I lived with my dad for all four years of or for like six years until the end of high school. And then my dad um, actually had, which I didn't know because my family sheltered me from it. My dad has schizophrenia. And um, every time, you know, and that's what caused kind of like the insecurities and like the not enough love and all that stuff growing up. Um, even though our life was on, on the surface, it was great. Everybody's life on the surface you know? was great. But my mother's family was very like, you know, hush hush about everything bad that happened in our lives. So when it came time, when I was like an adult, when I was 17, I came home from, I think it was grad night and there were four cops, four or five, five cops in front of my house. And, um, and I hear someone like screaming at the top of their lungs, like hysterically. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And I'd never seen anything like this before, except for, you know, I blocked out a lot of the trauma that I dealt with when I was very young. Um, and my dad was like my best friend. So like, I, you know, I never saw anything weird about my dad. Um, he actually took me to the FBI one time. <laughs> Cause like, you know, schizophrenic people have episodes, right? So, so it's like, I didn't know. Cause I was a kid. Like, I don't know why my dad's taking me to the 
and FBI and talking all this shit about my family to this what? FBI guy. Um, but but what was interesting? I know I'm talking very like very um, openly about this stuff, and I don't want people to think that I'm not I'm not being you know good to my family about it because my dad doesn't care that I talk about it. He's luckily passed all of this um, and in a very good place. But as far as like back then, I have a lot of tra like unresolved trauma. And that's what I've been working on on the past probably year and a half to deal with. So <laughs> let's, let's be honest. Childhood trauma is I mean, it stays with you. Yeah. Yeah. Forever. That's what we carry that into our adulthood. And mm -hmm. and it's good that you're working on that and. And trying to better. Yeah. Because your parents, you know, it's they created you. So it, I mean, if you look at like when when they really bring back trauma and any type of issue you have, it always stems back to your parents. Mm -hmm. Like that's, I mean, I did the Hoffman Institute and the whole thing was everything. Did I did Hoffman. It's like everything that f you up came from your parents and oh, it's yeah. nothing against them. It's just, they lived their lives and they didn't realize the effect they had on you. Cause as we get to a certain age, like it took me into like my mid twenties to be like, yo, my parents are just people too. They have no idea what the f they're doing exactly. either. Exactly. I mean, my mom was 21 when she had me. It's like, like, what the hell would I would have done when yeah. I was 21? I didn't even know my, you know, my ass from my face. <laughs> Excuse yeah. my language. But it's like, you know, it's like, what do you do? You, you know, we're, we're all learning. We're all learning. No matter how much we know when we're, you know, when we're adults, too. Like, if, even if I had a kid right now, I would be like, OK. <laughs> like, I still don't know where, where my do ass I start? is. I, I don't know. I think we have to, you know. That that's also something that I had to work on for a very long time. I actually, when I didn't live with my mother, um, I didn't speak to her for probably six years, and we, and it was very hard for me to forgive her for some of the things we went through. But later on in life, um, after you know, I dealt with, I actually helped my father um, get through his issues because his whole a lot of his family kind of, I don't want to say turn the other way, but it was, it's a lot to deal with, you know, like, I mean, if you want to save somebody's life, you have to continuously be there, like an advocate for them. People that are mentally ill need advocate, advocating, they need an advocate, they need somebody by their side to help them, at least until they get out of psychosis or whatnot. And then once they get out, they have a decision, you know what I mean? Like you have to, you have that decision and it takes a while. Like, like my dad's issue was every, you know, my parents got divorced and like every four years, I swear to God on the dot, he'd have an episode, but it was only because he didn't take his medication. So he finally hit a point where he was like at a point of, you know, tra trauma so bad that he was hospitalized and he was able to get back on his feet and everything was great. But he, again, had to make that choice to continue to take his medication or he'd be screwed. I mean, same thing. Very similar thing happened to my little brother shortly after my dad um, got better. And so my fiance at the time and I took my little brother in. And so I'm like shaking. I've, I still have trauma from this. <laughs> cool. But um, well, we appreciate you. Yeah. You know, you know, thank you for being open and honest about yeah. it. Like, thank you. And so one of, yeah, one of my brothers went through some stuff that was really difficult for him. And, um, and my fiance and I helped him through that shortly after we, um, helped my dad. And then, um, ironically, seven years later, my fiance went through some, some stuff. And that was, that was more so, um, drug related psychosis, um, which was very difficult for him and I, and I think he, he had a point like same, it, it was weird how like it was generational and going back to like how, how you say that like our issues are, are stem from our parents. It it's weird in my life because my fiance had always been somebody that was like my rock and my father was that way too. But both my father and my fiance went through the same type of situation my father you know couldn't couldn't help what he went through because it was br his brain but my fiance went through the opposite where he substances actually led him to a psycho psychosis and it looked very similar it looked i mean they mirror each other like i i, I remember 
my fiance actually was on the streets. He doesn't care that I talk about this because he's very healthy and happy. And he shares his story with um, a couple different organizations. He actually ended up on the streets for six months. And we were broken up at the time. I didn't know. You know, I didn't know what the f*** was going on. He, like, dipped out one day after an argument we had, and I didn't see him again. And, wow. And so it's, it, like, me knowing about mental health, again, like, in my life, I don't shut those kind of people out because, like, first of all, you know, if you're going through something, you're, you're people that you love are going through something, and they're acting completely erratic, I don't think... I don't think the best decision at that point is to shut somebody out, you know, even if it's hurting you, probably the help route would be better. But basically my fiance went through, he was on the street for six months and I would go, (laughs) I would go down as soon as I knew he was on the street, I'd go down um, and try to find him. And he, and it was really difficult because he was in a community. um, I don't know if you've heard of Ocean Beach in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that community, (laughs) love Ocean Beach, love the food, love, you know, the beach. But as far as like that community, they really, it's like, it's like they look the other way. So there's, there's people that, I mean, are, are, there's just, it's like a homeless population down there on the beach. And, um, and the cops are there. The cops aren't really doing much. I hate to say that, but, but they're probably numb to it at this point. Cause how much can you do? You know, how much can you call on someone who's having a breakdown? Um, but he was down there. I would go down. I'd find him sometimes, not find him sometimes, try to get him home. Um, so it was, it was definitely a journey. Like, Um, but finally after, you know, and you, you also don't like, I feel like a lot of people don't understand like how difficult it is to, to get someone that sick better. There's nobody understands that there is a very, very minuscule amount of people. It's the saddest thing in the universe. And that's the problem with our homeless. That's a problem with (laughs) murderers. That's a problem. That's a problem with our world. Honestly, we'd have so many less problems if we just tackled mental health the right way. Yeah. So. The sad thing is that people see homeless, you know, the homeless population and immediately think they're just drugs. They, they're lazy. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just hard, you know, when you try to explain, you don't know that person's situation. Yeah. Like your your fiance was a seemingly normal quote unquote person, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. And then he just disappears and he's homeless. Mm-hmm. And, and, and what's even scarier about this day day and age is like drugs can do that to you, you know? And, Mm. and a lot of people don't realize that. And like, you know, when we were young, like drugs was like something that it was like, oh, whatever, you know, like let's have fun on the weekends and, you know, around. But at the same time, it's like now it's so much more prevalent. And people, I mean, I hear about kids that are, like are kids that are doing it in like middle school. And it's like, I mean, not only talking about how that can affect your brain, but it, it's, it's just Especially if it's your brain, so dangerous. if your brain isn't developed yet, that is really going to have this crazy impact on you. But also like when we were younger and I don't like not to, when I was younger doing drugs, like there was only like three options. Exactly. You know I mean? like, exactly. Now there's like <laughs> different variations. Well, and, and you don't know what you're getting. <laughs> Like, I mean, how can people feel safe doing drugs these days if you don't I even don't, know what the hell like, you're getting? Like, but that, that's the crazy part. It's like, yo, back in the day, you would go to a party and you meet some people like, oh, I got this. Cool. Let's do it. And then now you're just like, you're like I don't want to. I mean, yo, I don't want to die today. Ne- ne- yeah, right. <laughs> Never mind any drugs part. It's like, yo, every time we're working a festival, what do I tell you? I'm like, yo, unless you see that bottle open. Don't mm-hmm. f-ing drink it because there's so many people that put these drugs inside these bottles. Oh, and then that's happened give them to me to, before. Yeah. Want to hear that story? Please, please. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So I was dealing with a celebrity, funny celebrity. um, And um, we, I served them the the bottle. They buy like a big, big ass bottle of PJ. And I was slammed. And we were doing like a one off. And, um, and I'm like the queen of f-ing chugging champagne. <laughs> like, that's like what I love to do. That's like that was like my selling point. That's a in skill in itself, nightclub. right there. In every nightclub, <laughs> chugging I the bubbly. God. Well, because what I figured out, it's like okay, I sell a bottle of champagne. It's five glasses. If 
if I have everyone do a champagne chug with me, then they have to buy another another bottle. So it's like sales tactic. Easy. Oh yeah. You know, simple. If it's a mag, better. <laughs> so um, so I anyway, I went to the table and chugged the champagne. And my girlfriend, after I chugged the champagne, <laughs> is like, does that taste funny to you? And I was like, I chugged it, so no. And she was like, oh, okay, whatever. So we go on with our night, and I have another glass. And I go back to the computer system because I hadn't been back for a while. And I cannot see the computer. Oh, shit. Like, literally cannot see. the Like, I can't. My eyes are like this. And I... I mean, I've done drugs before, but but when you when unexpected drugs are very <laughs> different kinds of doing drugs. That's the worst, dude. Like I was like, oh my god, and and I I actually looked at my manager and I was like, dude, I, like I was drugged, <laughs> like like I you you need to have one of the girls do my checkout. I cannot see. I'm fine, but I can't see. And so, um, luckily, you know, that was taken care of and, you know, they took care of me after and everything was fine. But, um, but yeah, it's so f***ed up how people do that. Yeah. I've seen it happen multiple times and it's like, yo, this person's here working, trying to pay their bills and this is their livelihood. Like, yeah. like you can, if your manager didn't want to believe you, you would have been fired on the oh, spot. Oh yeah. hundred percent. On the spot. hundred percent. And like, it's like, it's just so f***ed up it's like and i don't understand why people just because you have a ton of money what the f gives you the right to do that because we're serving like i'm not beneath you we're not right. peasants to you like you yeah especially if they're offering to you know what i mean like if you're gonna put drugs in your stuff and you know tell us that we can't have anything sure and your party knows you know and the girls that are with you know but like i mean drugging people for no reason it's so f up. <laughs> like what is the end game that you like? Exactly. Like, it doesn't make sense. Some people just want to do it to do it. Other fucking people have intention. Of course, yeah. You know, but then like, yeah, there's some people that just like, oh, we're partying. And if we're, because like when you're doing drugs, if you're on a level and people aren't on that same level, there, it fluctuates. You don't have a good time yeah. or like people next to you get annoyed. So it's like, well, if I'm doing it, then everybody's fucking doing it. And that's some of the mentality yeah, people that have. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So it's just like, it's just not. It's, it's un fucking necessary, and like then, then you talk about another traumatic f experience, right? Like, <sighs> yeah, that was not fun. That was not fun. Actually, that was like I hadn't. I don't think I'd done drugs because I mean I I don't do drugs on the regular. First of all, and I you know dabbled in stuff when I was like in my twenties, like probably young twenties. But um, I remember that happened to me, and I hadn't felt anything like that for years, like six years. And I was just like, what the f*** is going on? But it scared me so much that it actually made me not want to do drugs anymore. So I guess I'm thankful for that. So chopping it back, you, I mean, all the things you've been through, and again, thank you for being so open and honest and vulnerable, and, and we appreciate you sharing it with us. Was there, I mean, obviously all those reasons is a big reason why you're doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Was there like one specific pinpoint moment where you're like, this is what I have to do. This is what I meant to do. I need to make a change in this world. And this is how I start. The thing with mental health with me is, is difficult because I'm still in a place of trauma, you know? So it's hard for me to dive too much into it sometimes because then I'm like, then I freeze and then I just get stuck in this like weird place. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. It's really strange. And I've noticed that happen because Initially, when I when I graduated, I was going for psychology and um, and I was going for my bachelor's in psych. This was right before my or right after my dad had his break and everything. But then, you know, a few years after my dad almost died. And that moment, um, that moment, actually, weirdly enough, I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I can't go to school for this anymore. So I switched and I went for marketing and communications and I got my bachelor's in communications or whatever. But, um, but then it's, it's almost like in my life, my, like there's something pulling me like from the universe or whatever to tell me to go towards mental health because shit just keeps happening in my life. Like with so many members of my family, with so many people that I know, like, you know, my friends, I've always been the person to call like, hey, I need advice for this. Like, please help me with this. I don't know what to do. Or, the, you know, I've been the person that someone, you know, someone that's a crazy, 
mean person that I've been able to like get it, you know, get deeper with that person and figure out like, yo, like, why are you, why are you such a bitch? <laughs> you know, like what's wrong? Like what happened to your life? And like, you know, have those like harder conversations with people. And, and weirdly enough, like, I feel like for me, it's almost natural at this point to have those versus like having a normal conversation. But as far as, as far as like knowing it's meant for me, I feel like I've tried to push it away because it's really hard for me to sometimes talk about and deal with because I still have, you know, stuff that I have to deal with. But, um, but just recently, I think getting out of nightlife has really just helped me. Like, I'm like, okay, what do I do now? And now I'm like, this is my passion. This is what, like, I mean, the other day, like, I don't know if you saw my post on Instagram. It was like about some seeing some like homeless guy with a knife on a bus and shit. And it affected me so much, like just little little stories about like people and what happens to people and seeing, you know, the stuff that I see every time I swear to God, every time I see a homeless person, it irks me every single time. I, I think about like, I wonder what that person's story was because when I was, when I was going down, I, I went down to OB for like six months or four months. And for like, sometimes for like eight hours a day or in until like four in the morning, just trying to get my fiance to come home. Right. Because he was, he was so gone in psychosis, um, because of drugs, not because of his brain. And that's the danger, you know, of drugs, mushrooms, acid, um, mushrooms, mushrooms, you can microdose and be fine. But like, again, like even weed, like they're making stuff so strong these days that you have to be careful of your input, I guess. Mm -hmm. But, um, but anyway, I guess like, sorry, I go on tangents like way too oh, much. Oh no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's perfect for what, it's perfect. Okay, good. You're tying it in. You're tying it in. We're just sitting back and listening like, but <laughs> Like I'm it captivated and like, so, I want to hear what you're talking about. It's, yeah. it's like really honest and awesome. And like, yo, most yeah. people don't have like a lot of people, sometimes we got to really pull it out of people. So just yeah. to have you come here and be like, yo, this is what I'm about. Like yeah. I I'm a huge believer in, we all go through something traumatic for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it's because we're supposed to be able to help other people from it. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I you know, the cliche, everything happens for a reason. It, re it really does. It really yeah. does. Everything that you go through is a lesson that you you're, you're going to learn, not maybe in that instant, mm -hmm. but down the line, down the years, you're going to be like, holy f <laughs> something happened to me no, I know. five years ago and I didn't know how to deal with it, but now I do. So now I can help this person deal with it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and that's also something that I've been learning recently too, is like, um, I haven't been, I guess I haven't been a very confident person for a very long time. Like confident, yeah, in my ability to serve and sell and do whatever. But like, as far as like who I am, not confident, no idea why. Um, but what, what has helped me with that is just like stepping away from being defined as something like in nightlife, I, you know, like I was just always like, oh yeah, I do not, I bottle service or like, you know, I always, I guess I was raised to like have a role in something, you know, like a career or like, you know, I was raised very traditionally, but what, what all of this stuff has taught me, what COVID even has taught me is like, you really, you don't need to always have a plan. You, what, what's actually, I think the most important is, is like to follow what you're actually passionate about because even like for me, for instance, like I've been trying to block that for a long time because it's uncomfortable for me. But but I love the fact now that it's uncomfortable. And it now that uncomfortability is making me better at communicating with other people in my life. It's it's helping my relationships. It's helping me have like more of a voice in my life. So so it's a good thing. But it it's it's a journey for me because my mind is like all the time, yeah. <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> like, like I said earlier, you came to the right place. That's yep. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> my mind's like that twenty four seven. I'm thinking about eight no, million like different eight things different besides things fucking time. what's going on yeah. right here. So let me ask you. So do you? And I know we've spoken about it in the past, like you on top of the traumatic things you went to, you deal with a lot of your own anxiety. Like mm -hmm. I think people don't understand what's like living in a traumatic experience because your body is in living. If you've been through so many traumatic experiences, your body is in a fight or flight mode. Oh, yeah. All, all the, time. the 
time. I know that specifically. I know you know that. How do you deal with that ups and downs? Because those shamanic experience causes a lot of your anxiety. And like you said, I don't think people realize when you deep dive into yourself, yo, you got to be ready for that Pandora oh, box. Oh, like, well, that's part of the reason that I quit my job too. Because I was doing probably a couple of months before I quit my job. Doing I was nightlife. doing a ton. Yeah, doing nightlife. nightlife. I was doing a ton of internal work, and I was almost obsessing on it, which I don't think that's good either. You know, because you can get like even I was reading about something that said, like, don't do too much. And then I did. And I was like, oh, I get it now because you can get obsessed with that, you know. But um, (laughs) but so I started to obsess about it a little and like really dive into myself and have and really face myself. And what actually really helped me was um, my fiance and I go to couples therapy like every two weeks. And what's funny is I've never consistently gone to therapy. I'll be honest, like I'm studying to be a therapist and I never have done consistent therapy, which is something that I need to find pretty soon. But um, I've had therapists. I've had, you know, I paid like $150 for like three sessions and there was nothing, you know. It's so hard it, to find a therapist. It's nowadays. hard. It's hard to so find hard. someone you mesh with that's not that's actually a therapist and you're not just paying $150 to someone that's not going to do help you <laughs> make, make you worse exactly make I'm like, you worse i'm like no, ther- talking- therapists can do that no, like if yeah. you don't have the right happening. therapist yeah, yeah like they can put you down a bad I was, spot i was like telling her well the first actually uh going way back the first time i ever went to a therapist which actually turned me off to therapy and a lot of things um before i even knew you know before i even knew about mental health um i was little and i was dealing with one of my dad's episodes when i was super little and Something about my childhood too, which is why I think I have a lot of disassociation, is the fact that um, I like my dad would go through episodes, but then I wouldn't be educated about that. I would just, you know, my family would be like, oh, dad's sick again. Like, we have to go stay with the grandparents for, you know, however long. Or dad's sick again. We have to go stay with, you know, our aunt and uncle or whatever. And so I would always look at that. As like, like I would ask questions, but that's also why I was a quiet child because like I just was told not to ask anymore. So, but that caused a lot of disassociation and, and like my memory is, it's weird. Like there's years of my childhood that I don't remember at all. Wow. And, and it's funny cause I was just having the conversation with my mom. And so she's kind of, we have a great relationship now and she goes back and forth with me on like uh, the other day I was like what happened in second grade? <laughs> you know, like what happened? Because Pops I don't fucking remember yeah. that whole year. And she was like, she was like, well, this and this and this. And, and I was like, that's why I don't remember it. Because that was traumatic for me. One day, one night was that traumatic that I don't remember a whole entire year. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, it's I think I think it's really important for people to have the conversation, to be open and honest about what they've been through and and you know, like I mean, it's just it's the same thing as your physical health, your mental health. It's a, it's an organ, you know. If we looked at it at it like that instead of put so much stigma into it, then I feel like I feel like we could get a lot more done in this world well, with you, the whole mental health you thing. You said perspective I hate when somebody tells me, it's like, oh, you have a mental illness. It's like, no, my I'm not sick. I'm different. Exactly. Like, fuck you. Don't, don't, oh, why? Because my head goes a lot because yeah. I get fucking, fuck you. I'm not sick. And I think because we label people as quote unquote a sickness, mm-hmm. like, how are you supposed to feel? Like, exactly. you automatically you feel like, oh, okay, I'm, le- as soon as you get, uh, as soon as you get labeled, oh, you have a mental illness, I'm less than. Like, yo, one of the, I will never forget to this day, one of the first times, like, I had to start taking medication for it, and I went, and the pharmacist called it out louder, and I kind of looked around, and people, like, heard, like, oh, Ritalin, and I was just, like, I was, like, felt like such because I'm, like, now not only do I feel terrible, but now everybody else around me thinks I'm sick. Yep. And it's, like, yo, I'm not, I'm not yeah, sick. Yeah, they Fuck automatically you. say, well, oh, and, crazy. and that just goes by. Yeah, it's yeah like, yo, exactly. Man, and yeah. that crazy word, I fucking hate that word. I hate how people use crazy to define any type of illness or even homeless people. Like I have a so- I have a soft spot for homeless people. I I literally would sit down like on the street with homeless people until like four in the morning and have conversations with them. Like I swear to God, like the shit I've seen 
is is just incredible. And that goes back to what what we were talking about. Like, I have that inside of me. Like, I've had that inside of me. Like, I want to take care of people. I want, you know, I I treat every I treat the janitor and the you know millionaire the same way because that's just who I am. But um, but I think that people need to be a lot more empathetic and a lot more understanding regardless of the situation. Everyone I talk to, everyone nowadays, especially I talk to, is going through through something. Everyone. Everyone. Yeah. And and that's I mean, I mean, you can't even get a therapy appointment right now. <laughs> no, it's like it, but that's crazy that like it's a five it's six, so fucking sad. It's like you gotta wait three to four months to get a therapist, then you do two to three sessions. If you don't like that therapist, then yeah. you gotta go get another therapist and wait another three months mm -hmm. but in those three months i'm spinning because of those three weeks that came up and the therapist told me the wrong thing and exactly. now i'm like Fuck. same same exact thing has happened to me with therapy that's why i was turned off to it myself um but i think it's i think it's something that i mean like our couple's therapist he was telling us like man like he he said the because we've been going to him for like two years and the other day he like he looked at me and he was like wow you're finally being honest and i was like what <laughs> I was like, he's like, you're finally opening up and being um, vulnerable. And I was like, and I never noticed that I wasn't like that. But I think it's I've I've been in such survival mode since since I've been 18, more or less, that like I, it just, you know, I don't notice how I don't get my emotions out. I don't notice how I don't connect with those sometimes. And it's most of the time it's because I put other people first and I don't want to bother people but now I'm changing that narrative about myself so that because I need to be there for myself to be the best for other people so what so what kind of tools let's say you don't have the therapy what kind of tools do you have now that make you happy that put you in a in a positive state well so um well so one thing that really works for me I haven't gotten the meditation thing down and it sucks because but my mind is just so active 24 seven I'm on medication too I actually, I have um, general anxiety and I have depression, um, but I'm on Zoloft right now. Not sure how I feel about it. I, I, I It keeps me okay, but uh, um, going back to what you said, the therapist, I, again, like my psychiatrist disappeared. I don't know what happened. I don't know where she went. <laughs> what happened to her business? Where the are you? <laughs> I called. I'm like, I need my medication. Um, but so that happened. Dude, and that happened to me. Um, dude, like, I was on Prozac for a little while and I couldn't get my prescription. So I just yeah. went cold turkey. No, yeah. terrible idea. And Horrible. And, no, don't ever do that. And then I was just like, even worse. Obviously, oh, I went through like horrible depression, but I got through it. And then I mm. just it, like I weaned myself. I, I did it on That's accident. Good. You know what I mean? I didn't yeah, do it yeah, on yeah. purpose, but yeah. it was horrible to go through. You and always have to wean yourself off. Yeah. Biggest, biggest, biggest thing with mental health is don't ever get off anything cold turkey. Yeah. Even if your doctor's like, oh, it'll be fine. Like, don't. Yeah, but the worst <laughs> is when you, when they put you, so since we're all sharing our medication. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm on Wellbutrin and Boost Bar. But mm. before that, I was on Zoloft and I was on Prozac. But the thing was like, yo, I'm like, yo, this this is making me feel worse. Oh, well, you can't just come off. So you got to wait. You got to take it for another two months. So I'm like, I got to yep. go through this for three. You f this up. I gotta go this for three months. Then we're gonna try something new. They're like, well, this is kind of just a guessing game. I'm like, then why the f are you prescribing me something after ten minutes of talking to me? You don't give a f about me. You give a f about how much money you're making yep. by f signing that script and getting a kickback. Like, f you guys. Like, it's I a really, guessing game. Hmm, let's like, see. Like, how are you gonna tell me? Oh, oh Throw it's a dart at the board. So I have bipolar. Well, yeah, we think you have bipolar, but you could also have uh, a personality disorder. Yeah. Okay. Well, then you could also it could also be something from your ADHD. I'm like. Are you sure about anything? They're like, well, we're not. I'm like, then why the fuck am I paying you? Do you know how many times my fiance was misdiagnosed? Before he even, before he even was like fully in the system. They would take him before I got involved because I know, and this is something we need to have another podcast about because it's, once I refresh my memory on everything that I went through back then, um, because there's a system in place that is literally meant to fail fail. That's why we have as many homeless as we have, to be honest, I'm sure of it, but the system and suicide and everything else you see, but the system, like it's so up because like, for example, like he, um, there's, you know, County mental 
right? And then there's nicer places and there's better places. But like usually you see someone homeless on the street, you take them to County Mental, right? Like if they're having an episode or whatever. If you see and and County Mental, like, yes, it's it's good for critical care, but it's a swinging door. I mean, my dad went through there. My, my fiance went through there. Like they misdiagnosed. They, t- they said that my fiance had schizophrenia, bipolar. Then he came back another time. They said he had something else. And and then he went to UCSD and same same thing or a, a different hospital <laughs> for the record. Um, and they said he had um, schizoaffective and then they changed it. And then they just, you know, after the narrative changed and they finally figured out what was wrong with him, it ended up just being drug induced psychosis. But but that created bipolar. So he still has to be, you know, he he's on Zoloft too for bipolar. I think it's like there, there's a stat. It's like one like one out of every three people is on some sort of medication. And oh, yeah. all three of us are on it. So we don't yeah. fit that yeah. stat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah, on yeah. anymore, but I probably need some. <laughs> I'm actually going to probably change change. But that's the, the thing too is like it's my, a risk. my psychiatrist disappeared. Then I... I, you know, I don't have a therapist, so I have to get a new therapist. That took three months. Then now I'm waiting for my new psychiatry appointment, which is in two months. So it's like what what makes what what makes me upset about that about this system is the fact that like I don't necessarily need it that bad, but the pe- but people that actually need it and that are psychotic and that can't function at all without medication. Like how are we how are we helping people if if they're on medication for a month or they can't even call when they run out? Like I had to call every time I ran out. You know, like I had to call every time for an appointment. And that's that was like through COVID, I think I was on Medi-Cal or something. But like but but going back to that, it's like like these people are all on Medi-Cal and they're sick. How are they going to get better? You know, like they don't have anyone to call for them and sit on the phone for 4 hours. They're not going to. They're they're not well. So, so it's just, I mean, I'm sure that we're working on the system, but there's a lot of things in place that, that really set people up to fail. And it's really sad. If you can make a change, what's one change you're looking to make in the system as you're going down this journey to, cause you're, it, it's awesome that you're so open about it. Cause so if mm-hmm. you're really trying to make a difference, which yeah. is kudos and like, yo, commendable and like, you know, thank you for being here and talking about this. And, you know, we love you and appreciate you for it. Mm -hmm. It's like, what's the thing you're, what's the biggest thing you're looking to change? I'm looking to change people's perspective of mental illness and their understanding of it, at least initially. Um, Ultimately, what I, I mean, what my dream's been since I've been like little is, um, is to, you know, change the school system, start my own whole, um, what was it? When I was like 10 years old, I wrote, I wrote something. I still have the letter that I wrote when I was like 10, um, to myself about what I wanted to do. And, and I was, I think at the time I was interested in horses and stuff and they have this thing called, um, like a horse equestrian therapy. therapy, equestrian therapy. And basically like I actually, worked for a company for a while doing it. Basically it's for all types of disabilities, um, in children and, um, whether they're, you know, whether they're paralyzed, whether they're, they have autism, whether they have aspirin, like whatever it is, um, they get on. So we like strap the kids into these horses. Right. And it's like, like a lot of the kids like had autism. So they like are screaming, freaking out. Like, I don't want to, you know, Mm -hmm. do anything. And we strap them into the horse and the horse starts walking and their whole entire body and their whole entire, like everything just changes. And it's incredible to see. Um, And so that is something ultimately like aside from, you know, what I want to do with my YouTube and all that stuff. That's something that's my long term goal. And that's been my long term goal for a very long time um, is to have like a kind of like a wellness center. Um, but for children, like start, yeah, for start children. early. Yeah. 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 Start early. That's awesome. Um, and, and to, you know, eventually at a point change, change the school system, which, you know, God knows if that's where that conversation's going to go. But I mean, a lot of it is you got to, 
a lot of it is changing. Like we're not trying to change the stigma. Stop it before it starts. Exactly. So it's like, don't let these kids start thinking about it. Don't let society bring you down and label you on this. So Mm -hmm. one more question before we get to get you out of here, because this has been a great conversation. And again, we really appreciate you opening up so much. You've been through a lot of things. There's been a lot of trauma. Like we talked about, you know, it happens for a reason. From all that trauma and everything you learned, what's the one thing you appreciate that came out of that trauma? The one thing. I mean, there, you could give me multiple. Yeah, I get yeah. But like, what are some of the things that you appreciate from your experience and that you're thankful for? I'm thankful. I, it's going to sound weird, but I'm thankful for the way that I think. I'm thankful for the perspective that I have in my life That's a great and yeah. the understanding that I have with with <clears throat> people, like with everyone that I love. And I mean, I'm, I'm just grateful for my, my life and myself and that I found a voice finally, I guess. I think that's amazing that, you know, you've been through something traumatic. I've been through something traumatic. You just shared all the traumatic things that you've been through. And we're all on the other side standing here like, man, I'm grateful for all of that. So it's like, yeah, anybody watching, like if, if you're really going through hell, you don't stop, keep going. Cause when you Mm -hmm. come out that other side, you're going to be able to look back at it and be like, I understand why that happened. I understand why I had to go through that because if not, I would never be in this situation making a difference in the world. Exactly. And that's exactly what you're doing. So can you tell, uh, give us your socials, things where people can come find you, see what you got going on? Yes, um, my social is at Miss Sophia, S-O-P-H-I-A, um, Gumina, G-U-M-I-N-A. Um, that's Instagram. And that's all I'm going to give you because I don't really, I'm not really on any other platforms yet. <laughs> is, that, is that an Italian last name? Gumina? Yes. Yes. I'm Italian. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, so again, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for your vulnerability. We greatly appreciate you. Yes. Thank you for sharing all that and, and going deep and, and being, being vulnerable. Like you yeah. said, I mean, it's the best word to explain. Yeah. I can't wait to see when you start putting all your stuff together and just all the things we can collaborate with you on later. And uh, I'm sure we'll definitely see more Sophia on the Chaos. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being here. So good to be here. We'll see you next time on the Chaos. Peace. Bye.